All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming into this summit here today. This is um, welcome to shine your radiant light, igniting the worldwide spiritual wildfire we need now, global online summit. We live in an extraordinary time, both exceptionally promising, yet radically uncertain. And as we dive into uncharted waters and move closer to a critical tipping point, we see a worldwide awakening beginning to catch fire. If you're listening to this summit, you are definitely part of the amazing shift that is beginning to transform the world like a spiritual wildfire. In this summit, you'll hear from 21 amazing speakers who each in their own unique ways have been the way showers and the pioneers leading the way to the paradigm shift that is unfolding now. This summit offers inspiration, healing, and practical tools to anyone who is ready to courageously use their own light to help ignite this worldwide spiritual wildfire. Together, we can create a new world based in compassion, wisdom, justice, and joy. My name is Joan Diargo, and I am your host, creator, and producer of the Spiritual Wildfire Summit, and I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. And today, I am so excited to interview Cater Brown. Welcome, Cater. It's really good, good to have morning, you here. Good morning, Joan. Yeah, naturally good. exciting to be here. Thank you so much. So I want to I want to share with the audience a little bit about who you are, okay? So Cater is an internationally known ceremonialist, a diviner, a shamanic healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Cater has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and ritual healing methods from all around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based ceremonial encampments and trading programs. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina. And today his topic is called Activating Ritual Fires of Healing and Transformation. Again, thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's exciting to be here, Joan. These are exciting times we live in. They really are, aren't they? <laughs> so I, 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 go ahead, yeah. I would say just, just this idea of exciting times, I'm reminded of a quote by um, uh, one of our great eco-philosophers, Joanna Macy. Yes. He says this, he talks about this, um, we live on this edge of uncertainty and yes. it's the edge of uncertainty where our most creative inspiration comes alive. Uh. So there is this, this fine edge of uncertainty and creativity that gets activated yes. uh, in, these, in these times. Yeah, that's really good to remember right now because if we don't remember it like that, it could actually maybe plunge us into a downward spiral, but, but these are really exciting times. At the same time, they're very uncertain. Right, yeah. right. So I got to tell you, Cater, I was a, a little hesitant about calling this summit activating a worldwide spiritual wildfire because of all the destruction that's occurring with wildfires, especially now, out, you know, out west. So I was a little hesitant. But then I remembered, you know, a spiritual wildfire is very different than the wildfires that we're currently seeing, which often indicate that the life, life is really out of balance. So I was wondering if you could give us some context from your perspective for what you mean by activating ritual fires of healing and transformation. Well, I'll begin with a story. Oh, good. And this story is one of uh, me working with a 17 year old some years ago that uh, ended up in front of me at a wilderness uh, rehab center in which they come from all over the world and into this uh, wilderness experience and um, he had come from uh, Washington DC but prior to that he lived in a village in South Africa mm -hmm. and in that story, um, he grew up in this village until he was eight. And at eight years old, he left that village and came to Washington, D.C. 
And so all of a sudden we can see right away there's going to be turmoil mm -hmm. and, and difficulty. Um, there's a whole paradigm shift that now he's plunged into. Mm -hmm. And so he's in front of me now because he's gotten involved in gangs and in drugs and all these other uh, self-initiatory experiences or shadow initiatory experiences. Mm -hmm. And I knew something about the village he uh, grew up in. And so I asked him this question. You know, I said, do you have another name? And he said, he looked at me kind of strangely, like, how do you know that? And, I, and he said, yes, I have another name. I said, tell me about it. And he said, well, when I was little, I went to live with my grandmother in the village and uh, for the purpose of getting this other name. I said, will you write it down for me? And so he wrote down this really long name on a piece of paper in his, his native language. And, uh, and I said, read that for me. And what he read out had to do with fire and other elements and animals and landscape. Mm -hmm. And so embedded in this name uh, was a particular frequency of identity that his grandmother saw in him. Mm -hmm. And then he looked, he kind of looked up like this and he said, you know, when I left the village, the last thing my grandmother said to me was follow your name. Wow. And so this idea that uh, we come into this world from an indigenous perspective inscribed with a particular elemental frequency of medicine or gift mm -hmm. that we are here to deliver. And often the grief and the turmoil that we experience in life is, is a result of becoming uh, misaligned with that gift. Mm. Um, and that realignment is what brings us that that's the igniting that's the activating mm -hmm. of this fire and when i think about all the the fire that's happening externally on the planet mm -hmm. uh, both uh, literally and in other forms of uh, shadow fire like war and, and things like that okay. um, i think of the you know the things we disown in ourselves we tend to project out mm -hmm. um, and so when i see all this uh, turmoil of fire happening, I think, how are we not activating and connecting with our own fire? Mm. Um, so uh, I ended up writing this, this poem that, uh, uh, based on my work with that young man back then, mm. and it's, I want to share it as part of our yeah. introduction. It's called Good. Follow Your Name. Thank you. So follow your name. Pay attention. Pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Focus on the delivery of your medicine, mm -hmm. not on the stories in your head where you recount your limitations and losses. Do not indulge in such self-importance as a way to avoid taking responsibility for your medicine and the gift of healing that you came here to offer. Mm -hmm. You are the heroes and the heroines of your own story. And if you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that's not entirely your own. Mm -hmm. And the life you know you must live is the one standing just a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself mm -hmm. and move to the horizon of your own dreams the place where you live in the absence of the old stories, the place where the sharp edges of this unfolding moment demands your full attention. Mm. Where are you? I am here. Mm. Who are you? I am this moment. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not walk in the world in such a way that you allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. Pay attention. Pay attention. Do not walk in the world in such a way that you allow others to give you a name you have no belonging to. And so. Wow, that is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Cater. So this, yes. uh, this context of uh, activating fire is one of activating one's inner fire. Yeah. One's, uh, as an, from an indigenous perspective, 
activating those agreements we made with our ancestors before coming here about who we were coming here to be and what mm. uh, medicine gift we were coming here to deliver. Mm. Um, oh, I love it. I mean, and I love what you said about um, that one phrase, apprentice yourself to yourself. And I feel like that is what many of us who are really called to, you know, come forward um, to help heal the world and ourselves is, is that I feel like many of us are trying to figure out, okay, what is our medicine? What is this gift that we were born with that, you know, we could share to really make a difference? And so, you know, how does one find that, that gift, that medicine that we were each born with, right? Right, so it's looking to the, the old initiatory passages of, of all our cultures, across cultures, across the planet, um, where there, the rites of passage experiences, mm -hmm. rites of passage initiatory experiences were still alive. And, and they still exist today. There are many, many folks that offer initiatory rites of passage experiences. And in this day and age, you're not just for youth, not just for, you know, you turn mm -hmm. 14 or 15. Um, therefore, those periods in our life when we're betwixt in between, mm -hmm. when we're no longer where we were, we're not yet where we're headed, we're betwixt in between. Um, it's, it's that age around, I always say it's that age around 14 or 24 mm -hmm. or 34. Or 44, 54, <laughs> that is so true. You know, when we get in, that, in between, what are the uh, initiatory passages that uh, that we can step into to help mark those those experiences and, mm -hmm. and put them within the context of ritual and ceremony? So, like yes. uh, the Aboriginal walkabout or the vision quest or hill walking, as they might say in the British Isles. These okay. these ways of severing from the old and yes. uh, under the guidance of, a, of an elder and going into the wild, into the wilderness mm -hmm. um, for a period of time. And uh, usually it would involve some level of fasting and prayer and solitude. Um, those three, three aspects to all <clears throat> rites of passage across the planet. Yes. And, um, so we could say, you know, Jesus went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. Buddha went under the Bodhi tree. Muhammad went up on the mountain. Uh, you know, Crazy Horse went into the desert. There's just countless okay. stories of the initiatory passage. And these experiences are designed to activate that fire, that, that original uh, fire within, uh, which is the memory of this who I am. Where I'm, where I'm going, um, yes. and yet all of that gets cloaked by uh, disconnection and grief, and and, um, and which petrified grief then turns into anger and judgment and all these mm -hmm. other things. So, activating fire is often one of healing first, mm -hmm. healing our disconnection from ourselves, uh, f from the others. And not just the human others, but all others, yes. human and non-human others. Mm -hmm. And as that healing happens, then there's this spark of activation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love that. Yeah. There's um, to to borrow a concept from from a storyteller, Michael Mead, talks about there there are two um, two elemental trajectories of initiation, and. Uh, we could say one is by fire, and that is in what we would call initiation by the spirit. It's okay. to become impassioned, is to become uh, almost possessed with a passionate drive of fulfilling some mission, some some vision. Okay. Um, and often that can take shadow forms, which can end up as addictions and reckless behavior and things like that. Okay. And then the other one is a an initiatory trajectory of water which oh. is a descent a descent into water into healing into ancestral memory and reconciliation mm -hmm. and forgiveness and wow and and so what i what i see in these times is is there's a need to descend 
Mm-hmm. So that those of us that descend, the, the initiatory journey of descent is that we end up in fire, that we go down and to deal with these difficulties. Um, and that's what ignites the fire. Mm. Um, as, as Mead would say, you know, those that are drawn to the water end up in the fire. Oh, those wow. Drawn to the fire end up in the water. Oh, that is so <laughs> interesting because I'm really seeing, you know, really two two elements you know fire and water Mm -hmm. that are really expressing themselves today and Mm -hmm. and maybe it is an invitation as you're saying to to go back in and receive that you know internal initiation um to to find that that fire within us and i'm curious though cater you know because you talk about how it's important to have um a mentor or you know to to create that sacred time you know, to, you know, find that gift and, you know, that space within. What about those who may not have that opportunity, you know, to, to, to create that sacred time? Is, is there a way for them to, you know, connect back in so that they can bring forward their gifts in this time when we really need it? Are, are there ways to do that? Yeah, the, you know, spending time with, uh, I'd say spend time with someone at least 10 years older than you that you respect. Oh, nice. It's a very simple thing. Nice. And, and listen to their story and share with them your journey and where you are. Somebody that's gone a little further down the road than you have. So if we don't have access to therapists or other yeah. healers and, and we're in, in, in more of a closed experience, uh, at least we can maybe find one, one person we respect that's gone a little further down the road. Yeah. And, and uh, that we would think of as, as an elder. That's a great idea. That makes it really simple, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, those elders uh, are, are in need of, of younger people. You yeah. know, they don't want to be, they don't necessarily need to be regulated to the golf course or to the playground. <laughs> um, they have a lot to offer. And they, yes. say that, they say that the, the old ones and the young people have a common connection because they both have a foot in the other world. Yeah. So they understand each other better. Where those of us sometimes in the middle get a bit lost with all the <laughs> Very true, right? Connect those two. That's great. Um, you know, you, you touched on this a little bit already, um, but, you know, maybe just a little bit more about um, what an initiation is, because you, you touched on it, but maybe in a little bit more, and then, you know, some, in some ways, I think, and I'm wondering if you agree that we are undergoing a collective initiation, right? Mm-hmm. Like worldwide. And, you know, if an initiation involves a passage, what's on the other side of this collective initiation? So, yeah, I have often thought that. I have often looked at, okay, what's the micro and the macro picture? Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, we're in this this collective global initiatory passage. Um, and if we look at, the say, the common stages of the initiatory journey, um, we look at it from this larger context, which is if you think of, uh, you know, from a linear perspective, we, we think of birth to death on a linear time frame, and we begin our lives at least this one lifetime at birth and it ends at least this one lifetime at death. And so it's like this river that flows this way. Mm-hmm. Initiation is a river that flows the other way mm. and that it begins with a death and ends with a birth. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So what we call the severance phase of the death lodge is the breaking down of the old ways that no longer, no longer are useful. We're severing from either very reluctantly by you know, holding on with dear life to all those old ways that, that uh, are being you know, slowly pulled from our grasp, um, or we're stepping in and allowing a clear severance. It's like these things, these old ways of, uh, the old stories I tell myself about myself, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it serve me. And yes. have, I, have I trapped myself in a story that limits uh, my activating my fire? Yeah. Um, and so the severance phase is that initial uh, separation from those old identities, old ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. And then we enter the threshold phase, which I think is where we are collectively. 
Okay. And the threshold phase is that betwixt in between. You know, we could say that's when Muhammad is on the man, mount, mountain or Buddha is under the Bodhi tree or Jesus is in yeah. the desert. Uh, it's that in between time yeah. um, where we are crying for vision, as, yes. as natives might say. You know, there's, we have reached the capacity of our own uh, resourcefulness. And we got to reach out to something greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where the, the palms become open, the heart <laughs> becomes open, and we surrender. Now, uh -huh. surrender is not letting go, is not giving up. Surrender is uh, open ourselves to a capacity of greater knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. and healing um, that we can't get to unless we do. So mm -hmm. this threshold phase of going into or being guided into, say, the wilderness, or, or some ex initiatory experience uh, of release, of like, yes. uh, essentially, I don't know what to do, like yeah. help. <laughs> and then watching what happens, and then wow. what, what, what things begin to come to us, what, what new information begins to show up, or new ways of thinking mm -hmm. about solving old problems, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the, the return phase is, which is where we start to, we come back to the village uh, with, we could say a new identity, mm -hmm. a, a new story, a, a, a new question. Um, it's uh, Carl Jung and, and, uh, and more recently, you know, to name Joanna Macy again, she says, you know, there's, there's, run, there's one great question that runs through everyone's life like a thread. Mm. And if you can find that one great question, mm. it will become the lighthouse beacon for your for how you live your life. Mm. Um, mm. And yeah. so we learn not to not to look for easy answers, but mm. look for really good questions because it's the questions mm. that we live into. It's kind of like the name that following your name, uh -huh. so the questions that guide us forward. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see it in in some of the young people. Um, around the world, you know, that are, that are fired up, that are ready yes. for change. It's like, you're not going to tolerate any of the old story. That um, is so true, isn't it? They're saying enough, that there yeah. is a bigger, brighter vision. And, and I love what you're saying about this initiation process, that it, it truly is a surrender, isn't it? It's like, it's a complete surrender. And, and in that sense, it's almost like, is this true? Are you saying this? It's like, letting go of the wounded ego or the, the big ego and really opening up to a new way of receiving information that can really help to transform the times we live in. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. It's like shifting from what I've heard called uh, ego-centric thinking to okay. eco-centric. Oh, yeah, yes. Or soul-centric thinking. Yes. Um, and so that, that shift uh, of broadening our perspective to a more eco, soul-centric way of thinking yeah. um, about the problems and the solutions, and, um, and, and it's much more inclusive. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, not just the human and the non-human, but the living and the non-living. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this uh, thing I spoke of at the beginning of the paradigm in an indigenous life is that we... Uh, arrive here from the realm of the ancestors having made certain agreements there with certain ancestors that carry a particular gift or medicine that we too carry mm. and we come here um, and so staying connected uh, in gratitude uh, with those ancestral helping spirits to bring that yes. that medicine here that gift okay. here, here and, um, yeah here's a here's a kind of a big question or okay. maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But um, okay, we're in this collective initiation, right? And um, let's say that we successfully move through this initiation. Um, um, what's on the other side? What does life look like, like on the other side? And, and I, do you believe that we will move through this successfully? Or are you like, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah. Our 
I believe that individually there are people moving through it successfully. Okay. And, and more and more people that do that, the more collective that, that mass, that energy of change happens. I love that. And, and so I don't, sometimes we, there's a tendency to kind of defer the responsibility of change to much more of a global uh, governmental responsibility. Okay. And, and we got, we got to pull that back in. Okay. Gotta bring it in closer and, and start here and let, you know, the grassroots is that we are the grassroots. <laughs> let it begin to go out from there. Um, so this, uh, yeah, so this, this global need for change is, it's going to start here. Okay. Um, and the other thing is um, the healing. You know, I think I was uh, talking with a, a, a native elder the other day about some of the challenges of native people and white people and, and yeah. animosity and, and, and what we both came to agreements like the healing has to be acknowledged first. Okay. Um, we have to be willing to come together and acknowledge uh, grief that has been unacknowledged uh, because unacknowledged grief uh, becomes petrified and it becomes fear and anxiety and, and uh, anger and, um, and then it takes all these shadowy forms mm -hmm. in our culture, um, and yet this this need to come together and hear stories and and share those stories of of uh, of grief. Yeah, I'm so, so glad that you brought this up, Cater, because um, I mean, for those of us who allow ourselves to feel, right? You know. There's a lot to feel right now. I mean, for example, we're witnessing the, the sixth mass extinction of plants and animals occurring at a rate we've never before seen, you know, mainly as a result of human activity or, or we see human injustices that, you know, break our hearts. And I, I know that as we see this occurring, many of us grieve deeply. And, and you, you talk a lot about grief as a collective responsibility that in many indigenous cultures, it's really the outpouring of grief that keeps the pathway open between one's between oneself and one's heart. So I agree that's important. So tell us more about this. Share with us. Yeah. Yeah, this this concept of grief as uh not a personal dilemma uh of turmoil, but grief as a collective responsibility of offering. Offering that feeds uh the spirits that, that uh, it, is, it is water that is a conduit of connection for the heart. Mm. And it's our water uh, that enables the hearts to connect. Um, mm -hmm. And if, if we resist going to that place, you know, where we can discuss and argue about all these principles of, of how things should be, but if we've uh, repressed our own grief, Mm -hmm. It's going to start showing up more and more in our descendants and our children and mm -hmm. it's, it gets embedded in the land. So, um, so grief rituals, uh, several years ago, back in, I think it was 2015, I was asked to come uh, to the UK to do a ritual. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, let's listen in and see what ritual is being asked for. And so as I listened to the people making the request, I said, it sounds like this needs to be a grief ritual. Mm. And, um, and I was surprised that uh, 50 people showed up wow. for, this, for this grief ritual. And then it became this annual event that mm. now has gone across the UK and into, the, you know, into Europe. Um, and I, was, I keep asking myself, such hunger to come together um, and acknowledge grief and it's um, and the bigger picture of grief is it's not just a personal story of loss okay uh, grief we can also think of as an uh, that which can be ancestral mm. and unacknowledged okay. so grief can travel through family lines uh, when it doesn't get acknowledged mm -hmm. so that if if uh, great grandpa died and and his son didn't know how to grieve, then great grandpa didn't get grieved. Um, and then that grief becomes a hungry ghost that then can land on great grandson. Okay. He was a certain age 
and all of a sudden he's consumed with this depression um, wow. yeah it's hard to to pin down where it comes from that's a actually a true story that uh that i saw like that where three generations later mm -hmm. this grief had had shown up in this this young man wow uh, very suddenly and we traced it back to this unacknowledged grief in the family and so um so grief can be collective mm -hmm. in terms of when you tap into grief, you might begin feeling uh, such a grief that you, part of you thinks, wow, this is so much grief. This couldn't possibly be all mine. Okay. And I'll say, no, it's, it's likely not all yours. You know, there mm -hmm. is a place we can get to where we tap into a collective. Mm. So it can be in our bloodline ancestry. It can be more of a collective Okay. Uh, they look at hypo or or collective energy of, of grief, um, and then there's grief in the land. There's grief that's been unacknowledged. Um, yeah. You know, the one thing about energy, we drop into a, a quick physics lesson, Good. is that we know energy can, energy can never be created or destroyed. It just changes form, um, and so all energy that ever was will ever will be. And so when people sometimes will tell me, well, well, the, uh, the land is grieving. I said, mm. no, the land's not grieving. We put grief there that we haven't dealt with. Oh. And we have to be willing to, to re-own and move, pull that grief out of the land and move that grief. Mm -hmm. um, and so that it can be freed up and move again and release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so the grief, uh, you know, I said earlier, those that go into water, which is an initiatory journey of descent into healing and memory and ancestral reconciliation and trauma reconciliation, that, that kind of initiatory descent is into water. But to do that work on the other side ones up, ends up in the fire. Yeah. Because in doing that healing work is what activates, uh, or reactivates that, mm -hmm. that inner fire. Mm. Without doing that inner work, that healing work, we tend to want to project out that pain onto the environment or, or yes. perpetuate it onto the environment yeah. um, for each other. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the, this healing and, and transformation, the first, the healing, then the transformation. And with, uh, in, in indigenous cultures, well, I'll frame it this way. When, you, when you're feeling ill or well, yeah. not well, and you go to your doctor and then you go to your pharmacy and they give you a prescription. Yeah. And on that prescription, somewhere it'll say active ingredients. And it'll be a really long word that I can never pronounce myself. <laughs> right. And the active ingredients. I think this is what makes this thing work. Um, well, when we go back in, in, in our indigenous ancestry, the active ingredients to medicine are the elements. Mm. Fire, water, mineral, earth, nature. And so ritual uh, healing always drew upon the power of the elements. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about fire as an element, um, often across the Americas, both North and South, I've heard a reference to the, the term grandfather fire mm. and that that term references fire as our um, oldest elemental ancestor so oh. it's called grandfather fire okay and often you'll get grandmother ice or grandmother water because that's the second oldest oh. elemental ancestor oh. so in a lot of creation stories you'll see the first elemental presence is fire and the second will be ice or water okay and so there's this reference to uh, grandfather fire as the oldest elemental ancestor. Therefore, it's in us too. Mm, I love that. Another face of fire is, um, and I've seen this more in my work in, 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 uh, with African traditions, is fire as a doorway of communication with ancestors. Oh. Um, and so we, we bring offerings to the fire. We, mm. we, when the fire is activated, uh, uh, a door is opened for communication with mm. our loving ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so we, we uh, to, to go to the fire and take, you know, for me, it might be taking some Irish brown bread and some scotch mm. whiskey and putting <laughs> it on the fire. <laughs> um, as a gift. As an offering. That's as an what offering. Of, of my ancestors. And so okay. 
uh, and then open a door of communication mm -hmm. uh, with the loving ancestors. Yes. Uh, and then the third face of fire is as an elemental medicine. Mm -hmm. So we have the grandfather, the grandfather fire as an elemental ancestor. We have fire as a doorway, mm -hmm. uh, communication with our helping ancestors. Mm -hmm. And then we have a fire as an elemental medicine that is employed for certain types of turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, and so often fire as an elemental medicine is brought in to activate uh, action oh. and, and transformation mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, change at, at a transformative level like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there, uh, in, in working with people, there's a way of kind of hearing the story and then running it through the, mm -hmm. uh, the elemental prescriptive rituals and saying, is this, a, is this a dilemma that calls for a fire ritual? Okay. Is this a dilemma that calls for a water ritual, or earth ritual, or nature, okay. or mineral? And so when I think about fire rituals, um, I think about people that... Uh, get stuck between vision and action. Oh. And I think we are there. I think oh. globally, uh, I don't think there's a need for more new information to tell us what we already know. Right. Mm -hmm. we don't have to, and we don't have to pretend that we're confused and keep looking for more information. Okay. Um, there's a way that when people aren't able to carry their vision through action, uh, there's a sense of, uh, confusion that can show up mm -hmm. sometimes that 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 block between clarity and action uh, gets interpreted as confusion and so we go looking for more information right maybe if I get more information then it'll be time and that's a different ritual that I'd say that would be a ritual of air or wind okay right so mm -hmm. the other part, which I find is about 80% of the time, we are not confused. 80% <laughs> of the time, or maybe more, we come to that particular gatekeeper, that threshold, that gatekeeper uh, before action. Um, and what happens is if I take the actions that I know to take in my life, it's going to create disruption, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'll have to be different. I'll have to pick up some responsibilities that I hadn't picked up before. Things will change. Things will change. Yes. And, um, mm -hmm. and I might become unrecognizable to the to mm -hmm. certain people in my life that have uh, trapped me in a story of mm -hmm. how I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And I've co-signed that story by agreeing to be that. I call it, sometimes I call it old ways of loving, oh. where we make these agreements to limit ourselves because it's kind of how we stay connected. Right. And yes. so we come to that threshold. And if we were truthful with ourselves, we would say, this is not a matter of more information or clarity. This is a matter of having the courage to take the action and the mm. step that I know to take. Mm, I love that. And that, that really is what the times are calling for right now. And I, and I love how you say that we, we actually really do have the vision. We do. We have the clarity. Mm -hmm. And so the medicine, you know, maybe for our times is, actually moving forward with the action part of the medicine Absolutely. yeah wow. it's and, the, and they can be small actions they oh, can, you um, know please get more action. into that because i know the audience is like okay i'm i'm with you i'm with you but what do i do what is a specific step or how could i what can i do yeah so i'm gonna give you a couple of rituals because that's the way i think good <laughs> um so one of the rituals that, that would exemplify what we just talked about, this movement between clarity and action and getting blocked and, and feeling like we're confused or convincing yeah. ourselves that we're confused when it's really about courage and the courage to take the action. As I would say, um, if you can build a fire, do that. If, you can, if all you can do is use a candle and create a fire, right. put the candle uh, on one side of you, say about five feet in front of you. and then draw a line or put uh, maybe some cornmeal, make a line that I call the, the threshold towards stepping into your fire. Wow. Uh, um, and you've come, because this is where you've come to, am I going to step across this line into the, my fire? 
and 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 my manifesting my my vision my creativity um knowing that there are no guarantees this isn't about guarantees <laughs> as my teacher used to say all right yeah gold certificate of a guarantee it's like okay right that's really going to help <laughs> So there's no guarantees, but what I do know is you, you've come to this threshold. And at the threshold, you're going to meet all the gatekeepers. Right? What I call gatekeepers are all those things inside of you and outside of you that are going to become uncomfortable if you step across this threshold toward this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And start to examine in your life how you've been living your life in such a way so that other people don't become uncomfortable with how they're living their life. Wow. As a way to avoid the responsibility for stepping in more deeply to who you are and what you're here to offer. Mm -hmm. And that threshold can have all kinds of things. Well, you know, they won't like me. They, you know, um, I'll lose my friends. Um, you know, I might have to end this relationship or start this relationship or something, you know, things are going to change. Yeah. Um, but I can't kid myself any longer that I simply need to get more information. Mm -hmm. And when one is ready, you get to become clearly aware of the gatekeepers. I think this is really important at that threshold. Okay. And also acknowledging how they have served you in your life. Mm -hmm. So if there's ways that you, old ways of loving that you've held on to that just mm -hmm. don't work anymore, you know, thank you for being there. Thank you for getting me this far. And I, I can't live inside that story anymore. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then once you're clear about that, you step across that threshold and uh, it can be a line in the dirt. It can be anything, something that you can remove. And once you step across that threshold, I want you to turn around and erase it. Mm. No going back and step up to that fire and connect in some way with that fire that is sitting outside of you and as you uh, get close to that fire, think of yourself as fire recognizing itself as fire. Mm, beautiful. Um, and you just breathe and connect with that fire and let it, uh, and remember this piece about the ancestors, which is the other ritual I would share with you. Okay. Uh, as you just begin to let that fire warm your heart, warm your vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and then asking yourself, at the end of the ritual, maybe even at the end of this, this interview, okay. that you want to have, and as people listen to it, asking yourself, in light of what I have heard here today, or in light of this crossing this threshold and stepping toward my fire, what action can I take? What action am I guided to take today, this moment, tonight? Maybe when I go home with my children, mm -hmm. maybe when I go to work today, um, but don't let it be like, well, how am I going to change my life? That's like, it's too, okay. right. What can I do tonight before I go to bed? Yeah. What can I do, uh, this week? What action can I take? And I say, as long as that action falls within the bounds of your integrity, mm -hmm. do it and then watch what happens. Mm. Thank you, Cater. That is a very beautiful, powerful, yet simple ritual that any of us can take. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah. And I don't know where we are with time. There's that other ritual. How Please, we don't share. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. So the other one, um, when I spoke about fire as an elemental medicine that, uh, that we're working with, that would be that, would be that one. Okay. Now talk about fire as a doorway of communication with okay. our helping ancestors. Um, one important thing to understand is when I use the term helping ancestors, that is all to, also to acknowledge that there's this realm that I would, that's called the unwell dead. Okay. You know, those that they're dead, they're gone. I didn't like them when they were here and don't really want to talk to them now either. <laughs> so there's an unwellness and there's an unwell living. And it's this, uh, there's an old Irish proverb that says that the troubles in the other world, the unwell dead world, okay, um, can only be healed from this world. Oh. And troubles in this world can only be healed from the other world, oh. meaning the well ancestors. So this relationship with ancestors 
uh, is more than a conceptual idea. Okay. It is a palpable resource of, of necessary healing and support. Mm -hmm. So we have those, what I call the bright and shiny ones, or those that are well in spirit. Okay. Um, because we've lost the ancient rituals of, of healing and, and ushering the dead to the realm of the ancestors. We don't do those anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's this, um, there's this way of honoring that there's a lot of turmoil in both worlds, yes. both here in the living and the other world that needs attention. And so for this ritual, I would say, if you can, build fire. Okay. And in that fire, heat one stone. Um, and when I say one stone, I'm going to look about this big. Mm -hmm. the size of your head. Okay. <laughs> and um, in that fire, and, and, you, and the idea is to heat it for, you know, a good couple hours so it gets really hot. Okay. You could even do it in your house with your, with your fireplace, as long as you've got a concrete or brick yeah. hard. Okay. And, um, and you do an invocation, which is the invocation means you call upon um, your ancient ancestors, your loving ancestors, those that are well in spirit, those that are, um, can offer guidance mm -hmm. during these times. Um, and so your invocation is to them, mm -hmm. your great, great, great ancestral helping spirits. And, um, and then you bring, as I said earlier, you may bring food and, and things to the fire that are offerings of acknowledgement. Okay. Yes. And then as you sit with that fire while the stone is heating, think of you have called your ancient grandfather and grandmother to you, and now they have come and sat down. And oh. they say, granddaughter, grandson, what brings you to this fire? Well, in truth, your whole life brings you to this fire. Okay. And you may share your life. And I say, well, grandfather, grandmother, this is what's going on. This is what I need help with. This is, you know, what's going on mm -hmm. with my kids or my, my job or I can't pay my rent. Whatever's happening, this is what's okay. happening. Um, or I have this vision and this excitement. And so you share that. Um, and as you're sitting there, you know, you listen. That's the other part. Always listen. And then um, after a couple hours, you pull that stone out. You get a little... Oh. Something where you can pull the stone out like a small pitchfork or uh, a spatula if you're in your house doing this. Be very careful, of course, and put it yes. onto the big hearth. And you sweep off the ash and you have a little bit of water in a bucket. Oh. And um, I would say some uh, lavender oil, okay. lavender for sweetness and healing. Yes. And you sprinkle over that lavender oil in the water. And then you ladle some of that water onto the stone. Mm -hmm. And as, as that steam comes off, you breathe it in. And so what okay. you're doing is you're breathing in the response wow. of your ancestors. Mm -hmm. So that in, in indigenous life, the stones are the holders of story and the, the, the transponders and transceivers of information. Mm -hmm. uh, fire is that open doorway of connection with ancestors. So you've heated this stone with your prayers, with your tears, yes. with your story, and you've made some requests. Now you've pulled it out and you pour the water in. As you breathe it in, okay. you're breathing in the response. Mm. It's a good, so it's a really important night. The night for the next four nights, really pay attention to your dreams. Mm -hmm. Once that stone cools, you can create an ancestor altar mm -hmm. or shrine mm -hmm. with that stone there. It's kind of a communication device where you begin oh. to kind of check in and uh, with your ancestors about how mm -hmm. things are going. Oh, beautiful. Um, that's another tool of working with fire from the perspective as a doorway to our helping ancestors. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much again for that one. These are both really um, practical, concrete ways that we can actually, you know, connect with the ancestors. And, you know, especially with that second one, I w would you say that a part of that is really trusting, you know, what, what we hear, you know, as we listen, really trusting what we hear. And as we breathe in the, the steam, receive the steam, just, just to, you know, absorb it and really trust what we're hearing, not to not second guess, would you say? Or? To, again, listen with the ears of your heart. Okay. Listen with the, within the container of your integrity. Yeah. And, um, and listening, uh, 
I would say give it four days to just okay. in your dreaming, but also the, the question again, you know, in light of this experience, what actions am I guided to take and mm -hmm. make, you know, bring it in. Don't make it how I'm going to change my life. You can get lost yeah. in that one. Bring it in close. Okay. Uh, what actions am I guided to take tomorrow, this week with my mm -hmm. loved ones? I love it. And that, uh, we, we live in a world in our, in our Western society where we tend to psychologize a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so we, we way overemphasize meaning. And meaning uh -huh. is like, I say meaning is like holding water in your hand. It's not going to be the same. You can't hold the river. <laughs> you change every second. It's so true. And so, um, <laughs> so don't ask what does all this mean? Because <laughs> you can go down that rabbit hole forever and it will always change. Ask yourself, uh, what actions am I guided to take? Okay. That's yeah. the fun. Yes, I, I, I love it because I can see how we can, you know, by asking, what does this mean? What does this mean? We get caught up in the analytical brain, which sometimes will keep us away from what the truth really is. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, many years ago in working with my one of my native teachers, I, I shared this dream with him about a mountain lion. And I was, you know, my background being in psychology, I was still too, too steeped in psychology thinking. And I said, yeah, I had this, this dream of a symbol of a mountain lion. And he looked at me really on. He said, no, you didn't. And I was smart to say, okay, I didn't. But he said, you didn't dream about a symbol of mountain lion. You were with mountain lion. Oh. What did mountain lion tell you to do? Mm -hmm. You know, and this, so this, this whole idea of, of what we notice. Yes. The actions we take. Not impulsivity, but to bring those together with courage. Mm -hmm and use, use uh, that fire within our hearts, within our bellies, within our minds uh, to, to activate the courage yes. often to take the action. Mm. The courage to be, um, you know, more love, loving. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, mm -hmm. the courage to be more forgiving. Yes. Um, the courage to stand up when that's when it's time to stand up and speak and the courage to sit down and be silent when that's what courage looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well, geez, Kater, this is, this has been so um, informative. You've shared so much. And actually I, I do have a, another question for you if you got a minute and it's actually related to, to the gift that you're giving because you know, people, you'll be, you know, your gift will be right underneath this interview with a, a link to your website. And you have so graciously gifted um, a free audio version of uh, Singing Stone, which is a beautifully crafted story of the initiatory journey as told by you. But you've also, um, you're also inviting people to enter into a drawing for a free one hour cowrie shell divination with you via zoom video and i i would love it if you could share with people what is a cowrie shell divination yeah. so first divination is a way of looking into just say to divine into it's a it's a method of divination that i learned um, from my teacher melodoma some um, and then so i have a, a divination spread that i work with um, that's been active since 2003 and um, we'll, we'll add a link, uh, okay. in this where you can go read on the, oh, uh, much more thorough, but it's, it's, it's the understanding that essentially looking into our, how we align with the medicine gifts that we carry. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, are there any ancestral underpinnings of challenge or turmoil that are still moving through the, okay. through the line that are, are causing impact? Okay. Um, and unlike other forms of divinations or readings where people just give you a lot of information, yeah. uh, the purpose of this form of divination is what I call both diagnostic and prescriptive. Okay. So that at the end of the divination, uh, you'll be given certain individual specific ritual prescriptions oh, to carry out. It's like the ritual prescriptions that I gave kind of generally a few moments yeah. ago, but these are much more individualized. Mm -hmm. for the, Love for it. So there would be certain, whether they be ancestral rituals or elemental rituals, but they're, 
the, the ritual prescriptions are designed to uh, focus on the concerns of question that the divinee brings. Okay. And so they would then enact these rituals and maybe, you know, however long it takes to do that, because sometimes they're quite elaborate. Okay. Uh, you know, they might call me back in a few months and say, okay, this is, this is happening now. I did oh. this, this is what's happening. Yeah. And so that's all done through reading the cowrie shells, right? Well, there's shells, there's items, there's, there's a number of items and, and, and bones and things in the spread. Okay. And it's placed on a cosmology elemental wheel. Okay. So in, in divining you, there's reading the conversations of the, <coughs> of the items themselves, where they're okay. sitting, what they're saying to each other. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's just the energy of interchange that comes between <coughs> me and the other person. Yes. <coughs> you got some water there? I don't. You know, it's, I just didn't bring water. This <laughs> here, <time>. here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Take a breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then there's the information that comes in from another realm. Love it. it sounds like a really, um, <laughs> really wonderful and really insightful and filled with lots of meaning and wisdom that could be so helpful to anyone. Yeah. yeah. So, so thank you so much for, you know, offering both of those free gifts. And again, all those links will be right, you know, below the interview right okay. here. So, well, so Kedar, is, so is there, yeah. Yeah, is there anything else that you want to share with us before we bring this interview to a close? Um, I would say, you know, li live your life in such a way uh, that it's a blessing to all your relations. Mm -hmm. You know, let the way in which you live your life uh, speak your gratitude for your life. Um, and it's, it really is in the simple things. We can get lost in grand gestures and, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Mm -hmm. um, but bring it in close. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the magic of the mystery is much closer in than we think. Okay. Um, it, it's not something we have to, you know, look for down the road one day. It's, it's right here, right in front of us all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, boy, many, many, many thanks so much. I so appreciate um, you taking the time and sharing your wisdom and offering your gifts, offering your medicine that is so, so needed, in, you know, in the world right now. So I just want to thank you so very, very much. Thank you, John. Thank you again for the invitation to, to join you and, and, uh, and the other listeners that will eventually be here with us. Yes. All right. Many thanks. All right.